give you the top reasons why I feel CellPIP is a really good choice for people who are already here in Canada. So CellPIP is a completely computer-delivered test, which means all four parts, including speaking, are done in a computer lab with a computer. We focus on functional language proficiency, so this is not a test of academic English skills. If that's what you need, this test won't help you with that, but we have a test called CAEL, C-A-E-L, which is a test of academic English. But today, we're talking about CellPIP. So just for your info, this test was originally developed at University of British Columbia. And it is administered by the company I work for, which is called Paragon Testing. And very important info for you, the test is designated by Citizenship, or sorry, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, IRCC. So there are only two tests accepted by IRCC for immigration and citizenship purposes. There's CELPIP and there's IELTS. The only other way you can show proof of your language proficiency is by doing, the, uh, doing a link program and successfully completing the required level. That takes a lot of time, however, so this is a shortcut. Uh, are you aware that there are two tests in the CELPIP family? So the CELPIP general is the original four skills test. Any of you who are applying for permanent residency, this is the test you will have to take to demonstrate your everyday English skills in all four areas, listening, reading, writing, speaking. Uh, it's $265 plus tax. With the tax, we come in a little cheaper than IELTS. Uh, the test all in takes three hours, although you do need to arrive at the test center about a half hour early, okay? Uh, once you leave, you're done. You don't have to come back later and do a speaking test. Uh, we do offer a shorter test, the CELPIP General LS, which stands for Listening and Speaking. This is the test you would do for Canadian citizenship. And it's much shorter because it only looks at two skills and therefore it's less stressful as well. And it's, uh, you, you're in and out in an hour and 10 minutes plus getting in early. It's only $185. IELTS does not offer a shorter test for citizenship. You would still have to do the whole four skills thing. So we have a lot of test centers across the country. This is a list of the ones in the Vancouver area. So what happens on test day? All kinds of things happen, but once you get there, I want you to know what to expect you'll land up in a room a little bit like this. The, the test center that you see on the right, sorry about that, um, is a, a partial shot of our head office test center at, uh, at Paragon Testing. We have another similar one in Toronto. So you can see it's state-of-the-art, top-notch equipment with nice high dividers to give you a sense of privacy. Um, I wanted to show you this lady in the middle. She's not a, a good example of a typical test taker. Why? She's so happy right and relaxed and I think on test day most people are highly stressed and worried but I wanted you to see the headset you'll be wearing a headset like this you'll be adjusting the microphone make sure the microphone is not touching your lips and make sure it's not far far away it needs to be in the middle those uh, headphones will block out the sound around you however I, I want to be honest with you, you will hear people around you, and there will be a lot of people around you, anywhere from 15 to 40, and they will be talking during the speaking test, and so will you. So you have to prepare yourself psychologically for this. It's, um, it, there's really not a whole lot that can be done to avoid this situation. You need to go in there, know that that's what you're going to be dealing with. And don't worry about those people. They're not listening to you. They have their own troubles. They're trying to get the score they need, right? It may happen that you open your mouth and you're the only person in the whole room speaking because you got there first. Don't let that concern you. You just do your best. You want to get the score that you need. 
I promised I'd tell you why I think the test is a good choice, and it's all up here. So first of all, it's all done in one sitting. You don't have to carry the stress with you throughout a whole weekend. For the listening test, you're wearing a headset with an individual volume control, so you can set it where you need it to be. For reading, you're not fiddling with different booklets, with the reading passage and the questions and flipping pages and different booklets. It's all on the screen in front of you. Reading passage on the left, questions on the right. I'll show you soon. And um, you can scroll each half of the screen separately. For writing, we offer great little tools. So we have word count, automatic word count. And of course, there's a word requirement. So you don't have to sit there and count words and estimate what you've got. Uh, we also offer spell check. Yay! And uh, basic editing tools. So at the end, when you submit your work, it's all clean and tidy. And you're not crossing things out and adding things in the margins. Uh, for speaking, you don't have to sit in a room with a stranger and have peculiar conversations with them. Instead, you're sitting with the computer, you're answering questions based on things you're seeing, and your response is recorded and then sent to our head office and sent out to raiders. So nobody's raiding you at that moment. It's recorded and scored later in the next few days. Overall, the very best thing about the cell pip test or any computer test that's well designed are the timer tools. So we have countdown timers, timer bars, we also have play bars for the audio clips. You always know exactly where you are with your time. This means you can manage your time more efficiently and I believe that means you can score higher once you're comfortable with those timer tools. All right, so on the left side, you can see the, we call it the red test, the Sulpip General. That's the full four skills, and that's the order that they're in and the timing for each section. And on the right side, you can see the much shorter test with just the two skills. Let's look in at the first section of the test, listening. So in the listening test, you're going to be working with this for 47 minutes minimum and up to 55 minutes. It's possible you could finish earlier if you decide you don't have to use all the time for a section. Um, there's no benefit to rushing through the test because you can't save that time and use it in another section. All right, everyone always starts with exactly the same amount of time for each section. Um, now, before you hear the audio, you'll see a preview on screen. So you'll be given a sentence or two and possibly a picture. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Very important for you to understand the audio passage is only played once. And sadly, the questions are only there after you've heard the audio. So this is why it's so important to use the paper and pen or pencil that you're provided with. Um, you need to take notes if that works for you so that you have the key information available and you can answer the questions um, afterwards. So note taking is a skill you'll need to practice for this. Uh, paper and pen are provided and if you use it all up, you can just put up your hand and ask for more. Um, I already talked about the timers, so you'll be clearly seeing exactly how much time you have for each section. Um, be aware that it starts really easy and you're going to have probably about six parts in the listening test, or a minimum of six parts. Each one is going to be a little harder. So part one will be at a CLB 3-4 level. By the time you get to part 12, uh, to part whatever the last part is, maybe 6 or 7, it's going to be at a level 11-12. That's my level, right? So um, when I get to the end of the listening section, I'll explain why you don't necessarily have to worry about these very difficult uh, listening sections near the end. I'll explain that. 
So here's what the previewing could look like. You can see a couple of sentences there. Now, most of our preview pages do not include an image, but in part one, you are provided with an image. And that helps you to contextualize and know what to expect. Now, there are three different types of audio passages. The first one is the practice task, which will be really short. And this is provided to you so you can uh, make sure your volume is adjusted correctly and just get comfortable with the technology. After that, all of the scored parts of the test are either conversations with two or three speakers, or they're just one single speaker. So I want to tell you a little bit about each one. So in a conversation, you'll be listening to maybe two, maybe three people. What do you think is important for you to identify when you're listening to a conversation? I welcome your thoughts. Yes. Yes, the topic. Thank you. Any other thoughts? So a conversation, two or three people are talking. What do you need to figure out? Um, I, okay, so where are they and when is this? Okay. Any other ideas? Ta Tone of voice. What would that tell you? Yes, thank you. So that's a good uh, cue that you can listen for is do, uh, do they sound pleasant, like I hope I do, or maybe they sound aggravated, right? So listen to that tone of voice. It could really be helpful. Thank you. Any more ideas? Okay, I'll fill in a few things for you. So first of all, who are these two people? And how do they know each other? Are they family members? Are they maybe supervisor, employee? Are they friends? What are they talking about? Somebody mentioned the topic. Um, if there's a problem, and there often is a problem, what is the problem? And how do they each feel about it? What is their stance in relation to the problem? And um, also, if there's a problem, there's probably going to be a solution. What is that solution? So uh, these are key things you want to pay attention to and take notes about. Now, sometimes, well, actually, this would only ever happen maybe once or twice in the listening test, you'll get a video. So in a video, you're also going to get visual cues, not just audio cues. So what can those visual cues tell you? Did I hear someone say expression? Yes, facial expression can tell you so much about how that person feels. Any other thoughts? Sorry? Yes, body language for sure, right? If they're standing there with their arms crossed or looking really casual, it's going to give you some hints. Any other ideas? Yes, the setting, the surroundings. Thank you. Good information. So you caught most of these, right? The facial expressions, body language, posture, the setting, even the type of clothing, whatever they're wearing may give you a clue about where they are. So if you look at this picture, if we go back to the bigger one, where do you think they are? Maybe an office? Yeah, it could be an office or a waiting room, possibly. Or, yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but there are a lot of hints. All right, so let's move on and think about the single speaker. When you just have one person, it's a little different, right? So what can you listen for when you just have one single speaker? So in terms of cues, what I was hoping I'd get from someone is listen for pauses and intonation because typically you may notice me doing it. I'm not consciously doing it, so I don't know. But um, typically when people are giving a talk, they may pause before they get to a really important point. Their voice may get more stressed when they're 
um, giving a really critical piece of information. And the intonation can give you some clues as well. Also, so that would be the cues. And then in terms of information, I think we got uh, main topic details. Also, you need to identify facts as opposed to opinions. And whose opinion is that if you're hearing an opinion? OK? I talked about note taking earlier. So I bet many of you have learned about note taking in ESL classes. Can you share any tips with us that you think would be helpful in a test situation? Sorry? Yes, thank you very much. Abbreviations are so important because uh, the more of them you use, the more you can write down. That's it. Oh, okay, action words, verbs. Okay, I didn't actually think of that. Thank you. So here's a good tip. Write down um, the uh, key verbs that will help you if it, there's a lot happening. It will help you follow maybe the sequence of events even. Okay, so we talked about abbreviations and symbols. Organize your notes. So remember, sometimes it's a single speaker, but other times it's two or three people conversing. In that case, if it's Two people, you may want to divide a part of the page in half, put their names or something about each person at the top, all the related info with each person. Uh, use point form. Don't bother writing sentences. Try to identify those main ideas and important details and listen for the verbal cues we talked about. And just stick to keywords and phrases. Now, in terms of note taking, I want to caution you. Some people really do well with taking notes. I'm not one of those people. When I start taking notes, I, I, my attention goes off of the speaker and it goes on to what I'm doing. So I really urge you to experiment with note taking and find out if it works for you or not. I mean, chances are you're going to have to do some note taking, but you may find you need to keep it very minimal. Um, so uh, use our practice tests and experiment with that. And we do have two free sample tests. All right, I mentioned earlier that the test gets harder and harder for the listening part. So I want to explain why you may not need to worry about that. So there are 38 scored questions, and that, that means there's 38 points in the listening test. Um, what I'm showing you here is how many points you need to get a level four, which is what you need for citizenship and how many you need for a level seven, which is the lowest score you would need for uh, permanent residency. Now, these are very, very rough numbers. They're a very rough guide for you. It's not like this is the Bible. It's not absolute, OK? These numbers can shift a little. But to get that four, you only need to get about 11 to 18 questions correct out of 38. So when you get to the hardest parts near the end of the listening test, don't panic. If you are only going for citizenship, you can get all of those wrong and still get the score that you need. Okay? However, do your homework, prepare well for the test, and and know what to expect, and you'll actually be able to get some of those questions right, even if it's way above your level, because you'll have this, the test-taking strategies to do it. For a level seven, it's more challenging. Remember, there's 38 points. You're going to have to get about at least 27 right, maybe as many as 31. It depends on the questions you're dealing with. So it, if this is what you're going for, you really need to brush up on your note-taking skills and your listening ability if you think it's weak. OK, so wrapping up listening. I want to leave you with some strategies. And these are on a handout that you'll be taking with you as you leave today. So you don't have to worry about writing them down. So don't get stuck on the things you don't understand. Focus on what you do understand. You don't have to understand everything to find the answers to the questions. 
take useful notes, which we've talked about. We've talked about listening for main points and key details. Don't forget to listen for those verbal cues. Um, now, when you're looking at the answer choices on screen, don't expect to see the exact same wording you heard in the uh, listening passage. So you need to practice identifying paraphrased ideas. So it will be reworded in a different way. Um, even if you don't know the answer, guess. There's no penalty for a wrong answer. And in terms of guessing, always eliminate the incorrect answers first. You're prob you may not be able to recognize what the right answer is, but probably you can recognize some of the wrong answers. So just get rid of those. Okay, moving on to reading. Are you guys ready to go for reading? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we've got the reading on the left and the work area questions and answers on the right. We have the same countdown timers you had in listening. And again, this part of the test gets harder as we go. So time management is so important, especially in reading. This is a shot of reading part one, reading correspondence. So you have an email on the left, you have some comprehension questions on the top right, and then you have a reply message on the bottom right. So I want to ask you, you have 11 minutes for this. How, what are you going to do with those 11 minutes? What's the first thing you're going to do? Say it again. Skim the text, is that the very first thing you're going to do? Okay, maybe read the questions first. Is that what you were going to say? Okay, I would even recommend before you do any of that, you just preview the page. Just look at what you're dealing with, right? Uh, so that just takes a, like three seconds. Okay, look, this is how long the passage is. This is how many questions I've got. That's just previewing. Okay, then you're going to skim for general understanding in a very short time, not more than a minute. Um, from there, look at the questions and then scan the passage looking for the answers. And again, those answers will be paraphrased. And um, really important, make sure you've answered all the questions before that timer on the right hits zero. Okay, now this is my recommendation, but each of you is different. Your minds work differently. So you may experiment and find you want to read the questions first. That works for you. Then do that. But know before you go into the test what approach works best for you. This makes all the difference. Don't just walk in there without having done anything, right? Okay, now there are three main reading skills. So um, sometimes you'll get questions that ask you to say, what is the topic of the reading? Or what is the, um, the theme or something like this? So in this type of a question, you just have to get an overall understanding of an idea. You don't look at specific sentences. So this is uh, reading for general meaning. Now, other times you'll have questions that ask you to identify or to give a very specific piece of information. Maybe it's somebody's name, an amount, uh, how they felt about something. So in this case, you're going to have to look at a certain area of the reading where you think that information is and find the sentence that has the info. That's reading for specific info. And finally, the highest level reading skill is inferencing. I'm sure you're familiar with this. So this is where the answer is not in the text. So you may be asked to draw a conclusion, like what will happen next? And in order to do this, you need to uh, understand key information in the text and then make an educated guess. So that's inferencing. So it's really good when you're going through the test to know which kind of question you're dealing with so you know how to find the answer. So here is a question. Can you read the question in the text? I'm not sure how clear it is. All right, well, uh, some people are shaking their heads. So I was hoping you would be able to read it and tell me which paragraph you could find the answer in. 
Is that not possible? Can you read it? I, I'm not sure. I see a lot of people kind of squinting. So I'm guessing you're having trouble reading it, right? OK, so then what you would do with this question is, uh, I, you might say, you know, I think that's in the first half of the letter. Then you would isolate the area where the answer is located, which is in those first two sentences of paragraph two. Does, I don't know if anyone can read this, but if you can, do you know what the answer is? Yes, very well done. So um, the correct answer is start a new job. Okay, and um, there's no time to read through it and explain why. But in those first two sentences, all the information that we need is given to find that answer. So it's all about knowing where to look to find the answer. So for reading, uh, same thing in terms of the test starting easy and getting harder. There's typically at least four parts in the reading test, and each one will be harder than the one before. Uh, again, there's 38 scored questions. And um, in terms of the scores that you need, it's a tiny little bit lower. So you have a little more room to play with here. To get that four, you're going to need a 10 to 16 and a 24 to 28 for the seven. Okay, so let me give you reading strategies. We talked about skimming. Uh, don't try to understand everything in the letter. Remember when I told you you have 11 minutes? Some test takers, they, they land on that page and they just start methodically reading through the whole thing, trying to understand everything going on in the letter. You don't need to understand everything. You only need to understand the information that gives you the answers that you need. So don't waste your time doing that, okay? General understanding. Uh, we've talked about this, and again, I've mentioned paraphrasing. Now, watch the timer, which is in the top right, and make sure that you keep moving through the questions. If you don't know answers, guess, and just make sure you've answered each one. In the writing test, you only have two tasks. Each task, by the way, is the same length, 150 to 200 words. And in terms of time, it's pretty much the same amount of time, 27 and 26 minutes. Here's what a writing task looks like. Make sure you understand who are you, who are you writing to. In this case, you are a customer who went to a restaurant, you had a really miserable meal, and you're writing a letter to the manager to complain. What should the tone of your letter be? And how formal or informal should it be? Formal, yeah, you want to be quite formal. What about the tone? Would it be good to write something that says, I was at your restaurant the other day and I had the most repulsive, abominably bad meal I've ever experienced in my life. I demand satisfaction. If you don't do what I want, I'm calling the police and I'm having you arrested. Very inappropriate. So be very careful with your tone. On the other hand, you don't want to say, uh, dear, uh, Dear sir, I am your humble servant and I came to your restaurant and, and I, I don't want to complain, but, right? So you have to find a balance where you're going to be firm, but polite. Okay, so task two is quite a different task. Here, you're looking at a survey. So you're always going to have background information on the left and then survey choices on the right. Now, the instructions tell you that you need to explain why you prefer your choice, explain the reasons for your choice. So the first thing you're going to do is understand the situation, then choose one of these options. You actually click on it. Then you're going to write an explanation for why you feel this is the best choice. In this situation, you live in a community that has an undeveloped area, and uh, the, the municipal government is polling the residents, giving you a choice between a shopping complex or uh, a shopping mall or a sports complex. So you can say which one you think would be best for the community. So uh, what would you write here? 
Would you write an essay? Would you write a letter? What would you write? How many people would want to write a letter? How many would want to write like just like a, an essay type thing? Okay, so the answer is you can do it however you want. It doesn't tell you to write a letter, but if you're imagining you're writing to some specific person in the government, it is fine if it has a letter format. Just make sure if you have a salutation, you also have a sign off. Make sure it's clear where your paragraphs begin and end. Okay, how is your writing assessed? There are four main areas. So this is based on the rating scale used by our writing raters. They receive a great deal of training in how to do this. There are four categories. I'm going to briefly explain the main points of each one. So for content and coherence, the raters are focused on your ideas. They want to see if you've been able to come up with strong, relevant ideas that really respond to the situation and the, the task you've been asked to do. They want to see if you're able to develop uh, the right number of ideas. So not too many, not too few. Typically, this would be probably two to four ideas. With each idea, you need to include supporting information to show why this is such a great idea and put them in the right order. For vocabulary, of course, we're very interested in your word choice. We want to see that you have a range of words and phrases and that you're able to choose suitable ones for what you're talking about. Make sure that you try as hard as you can to express your ideas with precision and accuracy. Readability looks at all kinds of things that you've probably, if you've done ESL classes, you've done this a million times formatting, paragraphing, uh, connectors and transitions, grammar, sentence structure, spelling, punctuation. I just want to draw your attention to using uh, connecting words, tra uh, transitions, uh, phrases as well. Try your best to use a few in your piece as naturally and effectively as you can and appropriately. It's really important that you use the right ones in the right place. Finally, for task fulfillment, basically, did you understand what you were supposed to do and did you do it well? Okay? So I'm not going to go through these, but these are really useful questions. It captures the most important aspect of each of the areas that you're marked in. Each of your writing tasks is marked separately, by the way, and by different raters. And there's a minimum of four raters who mark your writing test, and there could be as many as six. That's a lot of different people who are assessing your writing ability. So don't think it's like one person and, oh, she was in a really bad mood, she had a fight with her husband, so you got a three. It's, that's not how it works at all. Okay, um, we don't have time and it's too hard for you to read, but this is a new writing task for task one. And this will be in your take home package today. So you can have a look at a very high level response. This is about 200 words. It's a level 12. Okay, so take that home and have a good look at it. We're not expecting everybody to be able to do a level 12 but it's a good example for what you might aim for. Writing strategies. Make sure you read all those instructions. They're really important. They're full of information that you need to follow. Um, at the beginning, so you have a lot of time for each task. You have plenty of time, 26, 27 minutes. So before you start writing, use that note paper, brainstorm some ideas, maybe cross out the ones that you think aren't really that suitable, then order that, number them in the order that you think is best, and uh, that'll help you get organized. Make sure that you have good ideas, logical support. Now, try to use descriptive language. Uh, this will really add impact to your response, okay? So practice working with adjectives and really like powerful verbs and powerful words. 
I talked about joining words and phrases, and I talked about using an appropriate tone. And make sure you've done everything, all the three things that you were asked to do. Don't forget to leave a few minutes at the end to review your work. It's um, so important, and we get so many responses that have really sloppy mistakes. It's very clear that this test taker didn't go back and just do a quick check. Clean up that spelling and punctuation before you click next. Okay, finally, the speaking test. I'm going to do this really fast. So there are two types of speaking tasks. Some have just text and some have text with images. For each task, you're going to have prep time and speaking time. So these are what your timers look like. The preparation timer is on the top. It's a countdown timer. And then at the bottom, you can see what you would be seeing when you're speaking. Can you all see the microphone in the gray box? There will be a kind of a wave mark in it which shows how loud you're speaking. So you want to have that, that little uh, line. It'll go up and down as you speak and pause and kind of keep it near the middle so that you know your voice is loud enough. For most tasks, you'll have just 30 seconds of prep time. For a few, you'll have 60. For recording time, a minimum, uh, you'll have 60 for most and 90 for a couple, okay? Um, you really need to practice to be able to know how to use your prep time effectively. It's not a lot of time, but once you practice, you can learn how to use it well. And the recording time, you've got to get, get out your timer on your, your phone and time yourself and get used to how much work you have to do to fill that time. So here's what a text-only task looks like. Um, there are a couple of hints at the bottom here. So, Often you're going to have to express your own ideas or opinions. If this is something you're not used to doing or you're not comfortable doing, you better practice because you need to do it well during the test. And some people are really shy. They don't like to talk about their own opinion. So um, if you're one of those people, you probably know it, practice. Uh, make sure that you understand those instructions and follow them exactly. When you're speaking, try to always be clear and focused and include details and examples. So tasks, uh, other tasks have an image with them and usually the image has a lot of detail in it. So I advise you to imagine that the listener can't see the image. That will help you to give a more clear description if that's what you're doing. If you are describing, start with an overview and then focus in on a few details. Choose the things that you're comfortable talking about. Don't talk about things you don't have the vocabulary for. And as always, strong descriptive vocabulary. The performance standards for speaking are almost identical to what you saw for writing, uh, except for the third one, which is called listenability. And this one now includes delivery skills like rhythm, pronunciation, intonation, Pauses, interjections, self-correction. Interjections, um, hmm, gee, uh, those sounds. Try to minimize those. Um, have a look at this question. It says, your friend's relatives are coming to visit her. Her relatives love to eat. Advise your friend on where she should take her relatives out to eat and why. So there are two things you have to do in this task. So you're talking to your... Uh, your, whoever this person is, and tell them where to take their relatives out and why. What's so great about that place? So think about that while I get this going. I would like you to listen very carefully. This is an actual test taker from an official test sitting. We didn't do this for you. It's a real sample response from a test. What level do you think she is? What did she do well? Were there problems? Let's see if I can get it to play. Uh -huh. Hey Julie, I've heard that your sisters are coming to visit you uh, soon and you told me that they love to eat and they like good food. Um, I think you should definitely take them to the city center. They have a lot of really great restaurants up there. I'm not sure what are the uh, food preferences, but they have pretty much everything up there. There is a great 
uh, pizza in uh, the Italian restaurant. Um, can't remember the name exactly, but I think you should take them. Uh, it's on the first street and second avenue, I guess. Um, they have amazing customer service and as I said, their food is really delicious. I think they would enjoy that. But if they're not a big fan of Italian food, I think they might like something. If you think they might like something more oriental, there is a great Chinese restaurant just on the opposite side of the same street. Um, they have really great Chinese and Vietnamese cuisine over there and uh, the customer service is fairly good. Um, and they have good prices as well. Uh, well, the Italian restaurant might be a little bit expensive, but if they, if they really like pizza, you should definitely try that out. So what do you think of this response? It was okay? Hold on. Um, just okay? It was good. What level would you guess? 10. Who said 10? Good guess. And another one. This is a level 10. Remember, the highest level is 12. Now, um, we don't have time, but basically, when, you, when you're at a level 10, it means you've done pretty much everything well. There are minor, minor things that have held you back from a higher score. But her content is full of information, lots of supporting detail. She has good, strong ideas. The, um, and her vocabulary is quite high level as well. The only thing that held her back from a higher score, well, I would have liked to see a little more complex vocabulary. Uh, she could have come up with some higher level phrases. That would have helped to push her up as well as her um, delivery skills. There was a little bit of a um, choppiness, just a tiny little bit. Okay, that's all we have time for. So, summar summarizing speaking strategies. Use that prep time. Write down ideas and vocabulary. Try to fill your full speaking time. Try to include descriptive details. I can't tell you how important that is, as well as good, strong ideas. Logical support, good intonation, which you may need to practice. Um, if you know that you made a mistake a few words back, go back and correct it. That's a good thing. Try to minimize the pauses and interjections. Think about your tone, and that's speaking. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. This is a look at our levels. It's on our website, okay? Also on our website, you can have a look at all of these products. Be aware we have online prep programs. Here's where you can follow us. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.